Hello and welcome to The Reasons I'm Broke, episode 73. I'm Kelly. And I'm Daniel. And this week's episode is brought to you by Megacon 2014. You can get your tickets at megaconvention.com. Megacon is March 21st through the 23rd, Central Florida's biggest anime gaming comic book convention. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. This is a podcast where we talk about video games, movies, comic books, the things that make us broke throughout the week. The format is we start off with a bit of news and we end the podcast with the pull list for the comic books that are on our pull list for this week. Our first bit of news is really sad news. Um, Yeah. This morning, Philip Seymour Hoffman was found dead in his apartment. A syringe was found in his arm. Yeah, they're saying it's a heroin overdose. Philip had been in rehab in the past and had remained clean until 2013. He won an Academy Award for his role in Capote in 2005. He was nominated for various awards in his career, including an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor as Father Brendan Flynn in 2008's Doubt. Is that our favorite movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman? We saw Capote, Doubt, we really enjoyed. We saw it Mm -hmm. in theaters that same year. I think we actually saw it in theaters twice. We saw... The, when the original release and then we went to the where they showed all the nominated movies for academy awards and that was part of it as well yeah every year they i don't know if they do it anymore but amc has this program or they had this program where you pay i think it was like 40 dollars or 35 dollars and you saw all of the pictures that were nominated for that year for best picture and then they gave you like unlimited popcorn and drinks i think it was so yeah that was the second time we saw doubt that year and we enjoyed it both times. We still watch it. Uh, Bobby and I actually saw it on Blu-ray. It was his first time. He really mm-hmm. liked it. We saw it like a month ago. And, I mean, it's amazing. And he did such a great job in that that year, 2008. He actually lost to Heath Ledger from The Dark Knight. Right. Right. Well, now somebody else will lose to him. <laughs> <laughs> but, honestly, guys, I, I'm really upset. He was a great actor, had so much more potential, could have gone so much farther. Yeah, plenty of time. He was only in his 40s, mm-hmm. and just every role he was in, we were just like, yeah, let's go see it. Let's go check it out. And I mean, it wasn't just the Academy Awards. If you just go through any one of his pages or any one of his movies that he was connected to, there's some award that he was nominated for in one of those. He also did a lot of plays, too, mm-hmm. which I think why he was so successful in Doubt and why he was nominated. And then in Capote, when he won, that's just phenomenal. So it, it's terrible. It sucks. And I think we're going to find that as we do the podcast more and more and more of our actors start to pass on it's i mean it's going to become more common and that's what's shitty about it <laughs> <laughs> you just better hope that kevin conroy doesn't go because that's it <laughs> yeah that'll be a, that'll be the saddest podcast we ever recorded <laughs> when kevin conroy goes yeah but this is a tragic loss you know guys honor him by going out and seeing one of his movies pick anyone he was great yeah if you haven't seen doubt check it out uh, see why people are upset at this actor's loss. Mm-hmm. But on to some uh, happier news. <laughs> <laughs> Still in movie talk, the latest Maleficent trailer was released. Mm-hmm. This one's scary. It's got a reimagining of Once Upon a Dream, and I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> the trailer scared you or the song? The song scared me. It's really, really eerie. I'm not sure the title of the song, but it's from the original Sleeping Beauty Once as Upon well. a Dream. Yeah, okay, Once Upon a Dream. There you go. And this is, remember, this is the movie written by Paul Dini, the same guy that with Bruce Tim created Harley Quinn, Mad Love. Dan, nobody cares. <laughs> it's written by Paul Dini. I, everything I mean, goes back to Batman. We care. We care. But most people are like, yeah, Disney Maleficent, Sleeping Beauty, blah, Angelina Jolie. I guess this direct, it's the first time this director does like a full picture. Mm-hmm. I'm like, everything's going to be fine. It's Paul Dini that wrote it. <laughs> Even though Paul Dini just writes a script, sends it in or whatever, gets paid. And then they make the movie. So now it's up to the actors, the directors, the editors, the cameramen, everyone. But I'm still like, but Paul Dini wrote it. It's going to be fine. It's going to be great. (laughs) Um, I will say when they first said that Angelina Jolie was going to be Maleficent, I was like, oh, really? But I'm, I'm kind of blown away by what I've seen in the trailers, at least. It does look really good. It looks... I'm not a fan of the CGI, of course. Mm-hmm. If you hear the podcast all the time, I'll take the costumes from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles over <laughs> like some CGI turtles or whatever, a CGI Maleficent. But, you know, it's one of those things you just kind of adapt with the current trends in the films. Later on, it's going to be something different that they use special effects with. So uh, I think it looks awesome. I can't wait. I think it opens, is it March? 
I'm not sure. Might be March or May. I know it's one of those two. I think it's March, though. I'm hoping there's going to be a whole lot more villains merchandise after this comes out. Yeah, they said 2013 was the year of villains. I think Mm -hmm. this is the one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Especially since they're making, I think they're making her out to be a character that you're going to sympathize with. Like, oh man, how could they do this to Maleficent? She was just trying to help. Like, no, she really wanted to fuck people over, but we'll believe what we want to believe. I think it's going to be similar to Wicked. Mm-hmm. where they kind of made her like the protagonist of the story and they'll do that with maleficent and if you're going to get anyone to do that you get paul dini again <laughs> <laughs> mr freeze holy shit harley that was quinn. awesome and harley quinn with mad love mm-hmm. absolutely so if you haven't seen the trailer yet head on over to youtube type in maleficent trailer and it'll pop right up and still with some more movie news something that's causing people to freak out again warner brothers has announced that jesse eisenberg will be cast as lex luther and Jeremy Irons will play Alfred Thaddeus Crane Pennyworth. Both casting choices announced on the exact same day. I think it was a couple days ago at this point now. Maybe two th- Was it yesterday when people were freaking out? No, it was two days ago. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, Jesse Eisenberg is the one that's getting most of the shit. No one, is. no one is. Everyone's ignoring the fact that Jeremy Irons is Alfred. That's pretty awesome. Jeremy Irons are going to have Scar. Come on, the guy. Also the villain, uh, Snape's brother. <laughs> <laughs> will be alfred but everyone's focusing on jesse eisenberg as uh, lex luthor because it's going to be they're saying it's he's too young they're saying that it's not something that he can play as you see him in the comics or in justice league the cartoon we're two over two years away still i don't really see what we're all worrying about we haven't seen any trailers we don't really even know what the story is yet but people are focusing on the casting we all thought heath ledger was gonna suck he did awesome People complained when they cast Henry Cavill as Superman. I thought he did a pretty good job. I did not. He had some nice muscles. That's <laughs> all he did. He's anyway, not a good actor. Continuing on. The people who pick these people, this is their job. They do it for a living. I kind of think the idea of a younger Lex is pretty cool. Well, that's the thing. He's the same age as Henry Cavill. They're right. both 30. Right. Um, somebody was telling me, I was talking to them at work the other day, I... You never saw Now You See Me, did you? The one with the cards? No, I didn't. And they were, well, I say cards, no. It wasn't cards. They were stealing money, but they were using magic and breaking into banks, and I don't know. Um, Apparently, the character he played in that was pretty much Lex Luthor. Oh, that's kind of cool. Like, exactly Lex Luthor. So, if he can play a character like that, he could play Lex. Everyone's making the joke of, like, is he going to create a social network to come after the Justice League? It's like, yeah, we get it. He was good in that movie. Facebook. I really liked that movie. <laughs> it's the, probably the one movie they saw. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have some reactions from Twitter, actually. And the first one is from one of our followers, at Dark Knight Drew. Quote, hit a home run with irons and then took another swing for the fences with Jesse Eisenberg for Lex. Hashtag the fuck. My only thoughts on the casting is if they will go way of the bald or by way of the ginger. Hashtag that really happened, folks. That's true. They could go the way of the ginger. It's <laughs> Which the you year of okay the with. ginger. I'd be totally okay with that. He'd have no soul, so it's yeah, all good. Uh, Lex Luthor originally had hair in the comic books, mm-hmm. and then due to uh, <laughs> one of the comic book strips, an error actually, uh, they ended up kind of sticking with the bald. Someone thought he was a different character when they were drawing lex and they drew lex bald essentially (laughs) and they worked it into the story later on so that's why he hates superman because he lost his hair because of his radiation superboy yeah from his meteorite (laughs) so great we have another reaction from twitter at brennanator said i'm just tired of people being upset about things every actor in this movie is a good one simmer down maniacs i like (laughs) this person yeah (laughs) good for you that was pretty funny yeah so they, they have that down. They've got great actors. Now mm-hmm. let's just uh, worry about the story and the uh, directing. I want Jeremy Irons to be the one that sucks. I'm just throwing <laughs> that out there. Everyone's so excited, and I want him to be like, I'll show them. <laughs> the one no one suspected. And, and he's still, he, he, just be, he just needs to be Scar in the whole movie. Like, no, you're <laughs> supposed to be Alfred. <laughs> just Scar and the entire like, time, mm, yeah. go to the elephant graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find Superman there. <laughs> We're terrible at Jeremy Irons. <laughs> <laughs> he became an old gay man, apparently. <laughs> On to some music news. Paul Williams, who sang Touch in Daft Punk's Album of the Year, accepted the award at the 2014 Grammys. I was like, okay, that's cool. I have the album. I love it. And I love that song, Touch. 
Didn't know until later why I love that song so much. <laughs> I found out through Twitter that he played the penguin in Batman the Animated Series. And now every time you sing that song, he sings to you. Yes. You see this little <laughs> fat penguin spinning with his little umbrella. <laughs> I need something more. And then Batman stops him. <laughs> you need to go to Arkham. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. I'm happy for Paul Williams. Good job, the Penguin. <laughs> <laughs> you probably paid some people. That's what Penguin does. Yeah, it's a corrupt win. <laughs> it is a great song, though, if you guys haven't heard it. I know everybody hears um, Get Lucky by Daft Punk. That's the big one. But Touch is amazing also. We had another link sent to us uh, via Twitter. This one's from at those two jerks. They have another podcast on Stitcher and iTunes. They mainly cover pretty much everything: comics, movies, TV, sports, and it's a comedy podcast. I think they're on their sixth or seventh episode at this point. Just search on Stitcher or here on Twitter at those two jerks. But the link was from CreaturesFeatures.com. It is a four CD set of the complete soundtrack for Superman the Animated Series. It is $59.95 and signed by composers Michael McCustian, Lolita Ritmanis, and Chris Carter. That's awesome. If they had that for the animated series, it'd be sold. Absolutely. And I told them, uh, responded on Twitter, that they actually did come out with a single CD, Batman the Animated Series, uh, soundtrack it had all the little jingles from everything the full songs and that came out years ago very hard to find now i got mine my friend brian actually sent me a couple of files and it was great he he bought his off of uh, ebay i think mm -hmm. so i wish they would make like an updated version just like this like that four cd set signed by some of the composers so if you want to check that out if you're if you really like that soundtrack from superman the animated series head on over to creaturefeatures.com on to some video game news in an interview with Game Informer, Hiromasa Shikata was asked, We found Majora's Mask and other subtle references to Link's Nintendo 64 adventures in Ravio's journal. Are there any other major Majora's Mask references that we missed? Shikata responded with, Having Majora's Mask in Link's house was a special request from Alnuma's protection team. Now why would they ask us to do that? This is in reference to the Nintendo 3DS's latest Legend of Zelda game. A Link Between Worlds. They're saying it's so far like one of the best Zelda games in years and possibly the best 3DS game. In Game Informer, they have a great interview with Shikata because they did award the Link Between Worlds game best 3DS game of the year. This issue, I think it's number 250, has all of the Game of the Year awards from the readers and from the editor team. And this is pretty big because this means that there's probably some kind of Majora's Mask I mean, confirmed in Game Informer, heard first here. <laughs> Majora's Mask is coming for the 3DS. The remake that they've been asking for, for God knows why, I don't know why. It's not that good a game, but people <laughs> really fucking want that remake. <laughs> I don't get it. I, I never played any of the Link games. There go all our listeners. <laughs> I didn't think it was that fun of a game. I liked Ocarina of Time so much. People tell me it's because it followed Ocarina of Time that Majora's Mask just seemed like it wasn't as good. But I actually played I played Ocarina of Time when I was younger, but I didn't beat it. I used to rent it from Blockbuster. You can't beat a game like Ocarina of Time in that rental no. period. It's like two days. Right, and I played Majora's Mask at the in the stores because you needed that expansion pack thing that you would put in the n64 mm -hmm. which the other game that used it i think was donkey kong or banjo kazooie one of the two and it came with that expansion pack and you needed that to play majora's mask and i you know we i was we didn't have that much money so i couldn't buy like that 70 dollar pack oh, or whatever yeah. the fuck it was later on in junior high school one of my friends let me borrow ocarina of time i beat it loved it but even then i was still like i never liked that majora's mask game <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. Heard it first on The Reasons <laughs> I'm Broke. Majora's Mask will come, I'm thinking, this year. You haven't played Link Between Two Worlds yet, have you? I have not. No. I really want to play it, but I have. I still haven't beaten Pokemon. Sorry, guys. Speaking of which, I beat Pokemon Y. Well, you know what, Dan? I'm glad you have time to do this. <laughs> but I have woman things like cooking and cleaning and laundry. I beat it. I beat the Elite Four. Easy. Not scary. <laughs> Didn't need to try more Sit than down. once. <laughs> I bought all those revives and hyper potions. I didn't really need a lot of them. I was like, what is this? <laughs> it's the easiest Pokemon game I've ever played. 
oh, I've been hurt like five. Let me drink the super potion. Like, damn, that's a waste. That heals 200. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I just got through Frost Cave, so I'm still forever away. I got to ride that mammoth swine through the snow. Mm-hmm. That was a little that's fun. That's a lot of fun. Um, and then I flew back to the city and went to my job because I make $60,000 a day at the hotel doing right. stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the super fancy store and bought things because I had money. That's a very expensive one? Yes. Ignore the fact that I have no money now. I bought two things and it cost me $220,000. <laughs> but I look fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> David Tutera would love you. <laughs> but really, guys, if you want to make money, that hotel is the place to go. You start out with 15000 a day. And I was reading online, people are up to 150000 a day. That's pretty crazy. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. That's more than you make beating the Elite Four. Yeah. Hell yes. But now that I beat Pokemon Y, I'm now playing Phoenix Wright. I'm loving it. I like that first case. It was a lot of fun. And I'm on to the second one. Can't wait to watch you play it so I can fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Some more Nintendo news here. Nintendo Force has kicked off its second year for its magazine. Woohoo! They did it through Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know what Nintendo Force is, Nintendo Power was finally finished, I think, two years ago now. Mm-hmm. The company that was publishing the magazine and everything decided to just stop the magazine and uh, no longer do it. I think it was Future Magazine was the company that owned it. They stopped Nintendo Power. We got them until the very end. And this new group made up from writers from uh, IGN and EGM and all kinds of places... They formed this new magazine. It's called Nintendo Force. It's in the same style as Nintendo Power, but I think with various improvements. You don't have as many advertisements as you did in the last one. The reviews aren't... There were some times when we were reading Nintendo Power, like, these reviews are biased. (laughs) Just because it's a Nintendo thing, you're going to give it a higher score. Whereas everything else, everyone else was giving it slightly lower scores. Not the case in Nintendo Force. They'll give a fucking game a bad review, even if it's Mario. They don't give a shit, and it's there. So I think that's very important, especially for a review magazine like this one. It does come out bi-monthly is the only thing. That's to keep costs down. And they're doing it with a Kickstarter now for the second year so that you can get all kinds of bonuses and pretty much get more for your money because that first year of subscription did cost quite a bit. But the second year, since they're having an easier time with the printing and more people are getting it, it is a little bit cheaper and you're getting more for it. So the Kickstarter is still running. They're over 60% to their goal now that's awesome and there's still like 25 days left (laughs) (laughs) it was a great magazine though and if you can get some bonuses with them that's perfect some other nintendo news lucario will be returning to super smash brothers for the 3ds and wii u that is the latest character that was announced for the super smash brothers game so no mewtwo i guess they're gonna go with lucario i like mewtwo better do you think he'll turn into mega lucario oh absolutely (laughs) That'll be like his Super Smash. I'll turn into Mega Lucario and... And kick your ass? Yes. Yeah. They were thinking that Mewtwo would have been the one to do that. That would have been great. I don't don't know why people like Lucario so much. I'm just not a Lucario fan. I don't know. People were saying that they should have done to keep with, like, okay, from this gen, we're going to use this Pokemon this gen. They should have used Zoroak instead of Lucario. That's the one that's black and red. Kind of looks like a black and red Lucario. But they were saying they should go with that instead. Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably. And other players still want Mewtwo. <laughs> I definitely want Mewtwo. And Pikachu. You know, let's just put all 151 in this game and mm-hmm. take out everybody else. <laughs> well, I, I still think they should do it like with the Wii Fit trainers. You flip from male to female by just doing a costume swap. So for Lucario, since it's pretty much the same moveset as Mewtwo from the previous games, just have it where you can switch over to the Mewtwo instead and problem solved. That'd be awesome. You can have various characters that way. You can do Mario, Dr. Mario, and uh, even switch Luigi to Waluigi. I'm sure they can somehow work that in, And then charge, like, $5 for a pack of X amount of costumes. (laughs) Money. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This past Wednesday, Nintendo had a presentation in Tokyo to address concerns with the Wii U. This was pretty important, actually. I don't think Nintendo's done something like this since the GameCube. Uh Uh-oh. But everybody loved the GameCube. (laughs) We loved the GameCube. It didn't sell too well. Although Wii U is selling worse than the GameCube at this point, I think. That's horrible. Nintendo said it will license its characters to new partners. In the past, it has done this with arcade games like Mario Kart with Namco. This means that smartphone content is on the way. Nothing to worry about here, I think. 
it's just going to be very similar to, again, that Mario Kart game that came out in uh, the remaining arcades <laughs> that exist here in the U.S. I mean, they're so huge in Japan, so that's mainly where it really thrived. But for this, this just means that they're going to have some developers. They're going to oversee whatever applications they're going to make for smartphones and tablets. And it's going to feature their Mario characters or Star Fox or Pokemon or whatever. So I think that's a good thing. Pokemon Snap for my camera phone. Not for the Wii U anymore? <laughs> well, I mean both, but I would buy it both places. Mm -hmm. Kelly, they're 40 bucks a piece. I would buy it both places. <laughs> I love that game. That'd be great. Or like a little photo editor where I can put Pokemans around your face. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> the next bullet point for them was Mario Kart 8 for the Wii U got a release date. It will come out in Japan this May. No word yet on a North American release. I'm thinking summer, maybe early fall. June or September. That's what I'm guessing. Yeah, that'd be smart. Yep. Um, that's cool, though. I'm excited. I I really like the last Mario Kart. I haven't been great at Mario Kart till since N64, though. I think my last... The last one that I really, really enjoyed and played a lot was Double Dash for the GameCube. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That one, because my brother and I, one of us was the guy that threw the items, the other one was driving, so we'd always... Especially on Rainbow Road, when I'd start to veer off the track, you can press the R button, your, your partner in the back would press the R button and push the entire cart over one way or another. So when I was about to fall off, it would be like we were in sync, like he would just press the R button and boom, like, like okay, we're not falling off Rainbow Road, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great. We had a lot of fun playing the game. Um, I think that's why I haven't enjoyed the other ones, because I'm like, man, I had so much fun with my brother playing Double Dash, and now it's like just me by myself. I don't know. <laughs> I used to spend hours on Mario Kart 64. Do you remember the western place with the train? Yeah, I do remember. I you used could go to, down the track. Yeah, I used to just drive on the track for forever. Like, I'd explore every little place, or the beach one. There was that secret place you could go across with all the crabs. Mm -hmm. I was awesome. Never hit a crab. I'm like, pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Flick them off as you go. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> so they really need it. Mario Kart 8 this year, Super Smash Brothers this year. That'll boost sales for the Wii U. Okay. Although I thought they sold pretty, you know, they sold way more in the, the holidays, but I guess that hasn't maintained and they didn't buy a whole lot of software with it. An update to the Wii U will enable gamers to jump straight into a recently played game instead of going through the user and main menu. Yeah, that's just further improving the interface for the Wii U instead of having to choose your profile if you have multiple profiles on there. So like you and I, we created our Miis, so I always have to hit Daniel or Kelly and then goes to the game menu. Well, not anymore. Now it just turns on and you can choose the games that you recently played or you can head to the menu. And I think that's a great improvement and you'll see it improve as time goes by. Oh, you don't like clicking on my name and entering my Wii Fit meter information? <laughs> we always have that competition, Kelly and I, over who took more steps, who burned more calories. <laughs> who always wins? You always get more steps. I always burn more calories. Well, I'm sorry. So at the end of the day, <laughs> mine's more effective. No. Yep. Who's higher up in the Grand Canyon? I'm pretty sure I'm like halfway there and I can't even see you. You're so <laughs> far down. <laughs> Yeah, she's talking about this feature in there where it'll actually take all the steps that you walk throughout the day and it'll measure it according to like a location, like going around Chicago or going throughout Hawaii. And then it'll measure all those steps into miles and then have your character walk there. And then you just keep adding steps as you go. It's a lot of fun. Grand Canyon measures the height. So if you go upstairs or up some hills, the uh, Wii Fit meter actually measures all of that. And it'll remember it. You can sync it to your Wii U. It's a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a whole lot of fun, especially since I walk farther than you. But I burn more calories. There should be one for burning calories. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> fire gets bigger. Yeah. <laughs> you burn down houses. Dan, this is really violent. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> the next one people really liked, DS games Yay! will come to the Wii U Virtual Console. Pokemon Snap? That's not a DS game. Shh, it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... Pretty awesome because you can use the controller, the Wii U controller, as the bottom screen for the DS games. And then you use your television as the top <gasps> screen. That's so much fun. And then also games like Brain Age, which you're supposed to hold the DS sideways for. That one, it'll just use the entire screen on your gamepad or on the television. So things like that. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Especially for some of the harder to find DS games now. Like the older Fire Emblem or the Phoenix Wright games. For those to come out on the virtual console, it's just an, a really good idea. One guy on Twitter I saw was like, why don't they just put all 3DS games on there too? It's like, well, what would be the point of the 3DS and then? It's not just in th that it's handheld? Well, like, it wouldn't be in 3D unless you had a 3D TV. To be fair, no one uses 3D. 
Well, well, everyone turns okay, that thing fine. Off. No, I don't use a 3D. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Like when I start a new game, I'm like, what does this look like in 3D? Boop. Oh, bad idea. <laughs> and I turn it back off. I think uh, the better idea would be to do something like the Vita, where you can actually play your game on the television and then take it on the go, but not just straight up like offer it on both. No, that's costly. <laughs> it's not good. That wouldn't that wouldn't work out as well. Maybe later on, once the new DS system comes out, which mm -hmm. of course they're working on now. They were working on the 3DS when the DS came out, so uh, maybe then. But for now, this is just great news. This next one's a little worrying, though. A new platform will come in 2016 that will focus on healthy living. This isn't a completely brand new video game system that they're talking about. This is just a whole new type of device that they're going to make supposedly just in Japan so far, but I guess they're going to see how it does before they bring it worldwide. I don't know. It, some people are saying they should just scrap the Wii U and br bring out a whole new system or just focus on handhelds with the way the Wii U is doing. Um, I don't know. It's it's tough to say. I definitely think that the next Nintendo console will come sooner rather than later. But for now, it's just one of those things that if they're going to focus on something completely different, like a lifestyle type of device, does that mean that they're going to not do the home console thing? I, it's It's kind of weird. I think they should do both. They're probably feeling a little let down because of the sales of the Wii U. And they're like, oh, let's try this instead. And yeah, probably in Japan, this other lifestyle thing is going to sell really well because exercise is part of their food pyramid found that out this last week that's awesome it's not going to do well over here probably not it's not someone's gonna be like that's cool let's go to mcdonald's <laughs> sorry it's just the truth this is a very unhealthy country we're getting better i think we're a getting better, little yeah. bit <laughs> i mean but it's like pulling teeth okay you can't buy a two liter of soda to drink today it's really bad for you. Well, why? I want to drink it anyway. I'm like, you're going to die, <laughs> sir. You do realize this. I get in arguments with people all the time at work. Oh, man, this is like my fifth Diet Coke today. That's really bad for you. <laughs> well, but it's better than regular Coke. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> Water is better for you than Coke. <laughs> Yeah, I used to work at a movie theater, actually, and I'd always have customers be like, I'll take a large popcorn, extra butter, and a hot dog, and a large... Extra cheese sauce. Don't forget <laughs> the cheese sauce. A large drink, half Coke, half Diet It doesn't Coke. do anything! Oh. Half the calories. <laughs> oh, it makes me... No, what, what really gets me, I work in food service, and people walk in with their eight-year-old, who weighs more than I do, and orders them... A whole hamburger, which is a third pound, pretty freaking big hamburger, and a whole side of fries and a large Coke. What are you doing to your child? <laughs> what? Heart attack at 13? Like, seriously. <laughs> that reminds me of the Louis C.K. joke, where he's, he's talking about he was out eating, and he's like, this is why kids are getting fucked up and everything, because you're giving them, like, all these foods that are just all salt and everything. You're not giving them vegetables and shit. And then they're, they're, they're like, mommy, my teeth hurt. Shut up. Here, have some soda. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. I could go on this all day long. It I love Louis C.K. He's, he's so fucking funny. <laughs> probably a great father, by the way. As he like, probably he's is. He's really funny, and his jokes are really crude, but he's probably like a really, really good dad. If you see him on Louis on Netflix or anything, his new show won a ton of awards. It's really great. Mm -hmm. That's probably what he's like. I'm just going to say that's a real life Louis right probably. there. Probably. So we kind of got off track a little bit, but... <laughs> The next, the last bit of news that they covered here on their little conference and presentation in Tokyo was that the 3DS will be the main focus of profit as Nintendo puts forth a new marketing campaign for the Wii U. I think that's probably the more important bit of news out of all of this mm -hmm. is that they do admit that they're, they're not successful right now with the Wii U at least and they kind of did make some mistakes. I think one of the main mistakes is it's still naming it the Wii U. Because having that Wii in there, people think, with all the controllers that came out on that fucking system, they think that the Wii U is just another controller or another addition to the Wii. Right. That's the problem. You, the Wii U, you, it's, it's so simple and stupid, I know, but that's what it is. People that don't follow the video games don't understand that this is a whole new platform, a completely new system. If anything, they should rename it and bring it back out. If they don't want to bring out a whole new system, mm -hmm. rename it. Name it something else. Well, yeah, especially like parents know nothing of video games. And the kid goes, I want the Wii U. Well, you already have a Wii. Why do you need another one? Exactly. Yep. It's it's that simple. It's mm -hmm. just a marketing thing. 
So I think to summarize everything Nintendo, Michael Pachter from Game Trailers, who I, I like, really like watching his videos, he said, he was one of the ones that said, at this point, just scrap it and start over, start a whole new system. I think the marketing campaign is good. Change the name of the system, like I said earlier. But 3DS is going to be where you're going to be making your money. If you can't get third-party support for the Wii U, do what you do best. Bring out those Zelda games and the Mario games. Uh, just keep doing that because people, honestly, we buy your systems for those games. For oh, the Super yeah. Smash Brothers, for the Zelda. We're not going to buy it to play Call of Duty on it. Pokemon Snap. Or the Pokemon <laughs> games, exactly. A system that you buy for the Nintendo titles, and I think that's always going to be the case for them. So focus on that. Make another F-Zero, Star Fox, keep doing that. New platforms, even though people don't support them when they make them, brand new series. But people want more Zelda, give them more Zelda, give them more Mario. That's what sells. I agree. Definitely. I think it's a great system and people just don't realize it. So I hope they can find a new way to market it. Like we've been saying ever since uh, last year, if you want more games on the system, buy it, support mm -hmm. it. That's how they make games for them. It's not like, well, I'm just going to keep waiting. It's been out for over a year now. If you keep waiting, there's, I mean, they're not going to make any games for it if no one is buying it. That's right. the way things work. Give it half a year, fine, whatever. But at this point, you're still waiting? Come on. You've got Pikmin. You've got Mario. You've got a Zelda game on the way. <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> and if it's a matter of money, because I do understand these games are really expensive, if there's one coming out that you like, GameStop is great with pre-ordering it. And you come in every week, put down an extra 10 bucks on it. You can find 10 bucks a yeah, week. Yeah, every week, 20 bucks every week, you know, even 10 bucks until eventually you have it paid off. Mm -hmm. It's another way to do it, too. Now we're going to move into some, I guess it's television slash comic book news. These next two things kind of go hand in hand. We did finally see the Powerpuff Girls premiere episode. Yeah, we were a little bit worried with the look of it. We mm -hmm. saw the trailer. It's not like the an hand-drawn animation or anything. Now it's all computer. Very similar to South Park, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, very close. Like I I loved it though. I did too. I really liked it. I felt they grew up with all the kids, which is what I love to see. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I felt that Avatar did that with Legend of Korra, at least with the first season. They realized, you know, five years ago or whatever, when we initially had this following, this is what they needed to see. Now we still have all those fans. They're just in their twenties now. Yeah. And I think that's what they did with Powerpuff Girls. I was amazed. It was great. A lot of the scenes, too, look really nice mm -hmm. with the lighting and everything. It's not just a flat image. They're, they actually do take the time to set up some really, really gorgeous shots, especially when they're getting blown throughout the city and or even if they're just walking through the supermarket. It, it just looks really nice, the reflections on the ground. And then, like you mentioned, the story itself, it's not like, say, Teen Titans, which radically changed its tone and everything, where it's not like a serious thing with Slade trying to come after the titans and every week it's some relationship they're building and now it's great titans, what are you talking about no it was great but now the teen titans go is like a single episode oh, type yeah. of thing powerpuff girls kept it just like the powerpuff girls were so you don't have to worry about them like shortening it up kind of like teen titans again or making it sillier than it was this is a legitimate reboot to the powerpuff girls and apparently the mayor and Miss Bellum have something going on. <laughs> totally hinted at that all over this episode. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> and you still don't see your face. That makes me so happy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was great. I definitely recommend it. Um, I'm sure it's online somewhere if you guys don't have cable or didn't get a chance to record it. And I think there's a second episode out too. We just haven't had time to catch it yet. Yeah. Still related to the Powerpuff Girls. Last week we had talked about that variant cover to Powerpuff Girls number six. Well, now there's a little bit more responses Ooh. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about Dennis Barger. This is the retailer that was complaining about the cover, how he didn't want to carry it, and how they can do this. He said this week that the media portrayed him as a villain. He went on to say that he just wants to protect kids from these kinds of images as they are the future of the dying, he says, comic book industry. He was quoted saying, All it takes is one giant mistake to upset the parents of those new readers and we will lose the industry. So we'll stop there before we move on to what the artist responded with, <laughs> <laughs> which is my favorite. This variant cover, he didn't have to get again, just like I said last week. And now he's saying that the media portrayed him as a villain, and we did as well last week. And I'm going to stick to that because he shouldn't have... <laughs> he pretty much is a villain. The thing, too, is... And I think we... Did we point this out last week? Or maybe you said it to me during the week. This cover got so much more publicity 
than it would have because of what he said. If he hadn't said anything, maybe a few people would have been like, oh, that looks a little, I'm, I'm not going to get that. But nobody would have been losing their minds and exploding and bringing as much attention to this as they did. Half those people who responded and said, yes, it's too sexual, probably never would have even seen the cover. Right. Or purchased the book anyway. Exactly. So Mimi Yoon, the artist to the cover, said, Unfortunately, the comic book will never make it to stores. Yes, I'm truly disappointed because a perverted mind decided to see in this image what his dirty mind had conjured up and barked loud enough. She went on to say that ironically, like you said, complaining about the cover has brought more attention to it and that more kids and adults will have seen it now than if it had just gone to retailers. Her final note, <laughs> which was my favorite, was when she posted a picture of Dennis Barger next to two women bending over from his Facebook account. <laughs> uh, I told you he was a pervert. That's what bothered him. He's a pervert. <laughs> He saw it and he was bothered by it because they were the Powerpuff Girls. and uh... <laughs> he, was, he was feeling things. <laughs> like when Superman feels things for Batman. Oh, yeah, those same kind of things. You know what? He's not a villain now. I yes, like he him. <laughs> <laughs> so Mimi Yoon, she actually went on to get more work from IDW. They actually told her that she can make another cover in the future. So she will. That's and I awesome. Hope, I hope that she makes like a funny fucking cover in relation to this. I hope she makes them completely covered up with like giant coats and you can't even see their face just <laughs> the longest skirts ever just to, just to be like here you go they look Amish. not sexualized yeah <laughs> that would be awesome that'd be great good for her i'm glad she got some more work though i did really like her cover i'm sad that didn't make it into stores but it made it all over the internet so yeah. <laughs> it's good for her yeah good job dennis the secret hero of all of this <laughs> That relates to our Twitter question of the week. Mm -hmm. While there has been overwhelming support for the piece, we did get a couple of opposing tweets to the question, do you think the Powerpuff Girls were sexualized in the now cancel variant cover of Powerpuff Girls number six? At Wazgo said, yes, I read the artist's defense of the piece, but all her work felt sexualized, intentional or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At Camancho Jess said, yeah, I thought it was a bit too much to be honest. I wouldn't have been happy selling this at the shop. If you listened to our podcast last week, I don't really agree with either of these. It's just one of those things, I guess, that people are going to... I don't know, if they had seen that same cover also, would they have objected? Or maybe it's just because now the attention is also on it. I'm not sure, but At Wazgo does bring up a point that her previous work, she does sexualize a lot of her characters, I guess. I looked through her previous work. It wasn't that bad. I didn't think it was, again, it wasn't like the Powerpuff Girls had their <laughs> legs open or whatever. <laughs> and her past work doesn't really have something too vulgar like that. And even if it did, this cover still doesn't have that. Right. So it doesn't even relate to any of that. But it just goes to show that some of our uh, broquettes uh, <laughs> don't agree with us, and that's well, fine. You know, I, I do appreciate that difference in opinion, though. That's what makes for a good conversation. That's why I like doing the podcast with you, because... We argue about Catwoman and Talia all the time or <laughs> something like that. If everyone agreed on everything, then... Yeah, thank you very much for the responses mm -hmm. on Twitter. Thank you, if guys. If you want to continue to share your thoughts on this, find us on Twitter at Reasons I'm Broke. Finally, we're going to move on to some Megacon 2014 news. It's taking place March 21st through the 23rd, so we're about a month and a half away, Brokettes. You can pick up your tickets at megaconvention.com. Pick them up now. It's $10 cheaper if you buy them online than at the door. I got the brochure. I looked. <laughs> <laughs> but we are so excited. Uh, you said you had a dream about being at Megacon. Last night I did, actually. <laughs> I was really excited I had it, too, because I'm like, I can talk about this on the podcast. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> and nothing against the artists or anything. It's just dreams just happen really weird. But basically, I, I dreamt that we got the we got the tickets in advance, so we got to go in an hour early like you can in real life. Mm -hmm, on Friday. So, so I'm running in there. And I'm like, okay, so the Did first thing I'm going to do... literally run yeah, in like a little kid? With my, my comics, my blank was, Justice League of America Was I covers. there or were you like, fuck this girl, I'm I, going it by It was myself. just me by myself. Man. <laughs> and I'm running through the convention. I'm like, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is go straight to the artists and the writers because I know they're going to have the line. So I went straight to Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor's table who are writing, of course, uh, Harley Quinn, number zero, number one, number two is out now in the rest of the series. He's also doing All-Star Western. 
So I went up there with my Justice League of America cover to have them each draw on it. For whatever reason, they still drew Harley Quinn on it. <laughs> and then something I said pissed off Jimmy, and he charged me an extra eight dollars. But <laughs> it still ended up being like thirty three. Why like, eight dollars? I don't know. <laughs> it's a it's a dream. <laughs> Nothing makes sense. And the best part was was Amanda only charged twenty five for this awesome Harley Quinn like cover that she drew up, and I'm like. And then I woke up. That's the one part I was sad about. I'm like, it's not going to be that cheap. <laughs> I don't even know if she's going to draw at the convention. They might just be doing signings. But mm-hmm. uh, I did wake up right after I reached uh, Scotty Young's table, who I was going to get to draw Martian Manhunter. And then I woke up. And actually, that's why we're going to talk about him this week. <laughs> yeah. Um, Scotty Young will actually be at the convention. His work includes Venom, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and Deadpool. If you just search Scotty Young, it's very... Tim Burton-ish, I guess I would say, yeah, but at this point, it's close. more like his style now. It's more Scotty Young than anything. Didn't he also do the Young Avengers? He also did the cover to A Babies versus X Babies, um, which I love the cover. It was adorable, and then the book itself was really cute. So pick that up and have him sign the cover too. Why not? If you walk up to any Marvel wall at any comic book shop and look through all their variants, you're bound to see one of the Scotty Young ones. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of the Marvel characters as babies or kind of in that chibi style. But it's it's Scotty Young. It's his thing. And he's a really good artist. I am definitely can't wait to see him. I'm going to have him draw me up a Martian Manhunter. It's going to be great. Another guest that has been added to the guest list for Megacon 2014 is Jennifer Hale. She has done tons of voiceover work in video games, including Grandia 2, Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic... Tales of Symphonia, and the Mass Effect trilogy. Boo, Mass Effect. Love Mass Effect. Boo, Mass Effect. Really good games. Boo, (laughs) terrible. She's also the better of the two Shepherds. I felt like she was the better actor out of the two. Mm, Okay. I didn't watch you play Mass Effect (laughs) because I hate that game. Nothing against Male Shepherd, but Fem Shep, she really put some emotion behind the role and and I like Mark Meir. Don't get me wrong. He's he's great. He's a nice guy. He was, we met him at Megacon last year. Exactly. He was really nice, yeah. But Jennifer Hale knocked it out of the park. Just mm-hmm. really good job with her role. Will you be having her sign your Mass Effect 2 then? Uh, my Mass Effect 3. three. Well, yeah. Mass Effect also. Yeah, definitely. Mass Effect 2, unfortunately, doesn't have Femme Shep on the cover. And there was no reversible cover for that one back then. So I'm going to have her sign my collector's edition of Mass Effect 3, which does have Femme Shep on one side. Awesome can't wait and i found out okay so megacon sent me this little brochure and i was so excited and i'm flipping through winnie the pooh is gonna be there (laughs) jim cummings i'm so excited um but jim cummings also plays pete excited for that too you should have him sign the base of your pete pulling mickey oh yeah that's true i do have (laughs) i do have a statue of a black and white the steamboat willie scene where he's pulling mickey from the steering wheel Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's really awesome. That's awesome. Cannot wait. March 21st through the 23rd. The countdown has begun. Get your tickets at megaconvention.com. Now we can jump on to our comics from this week. Mm Mm-hmm. A lot of comics this week uh, compared to last week's. Our first comic is Adventure Time 2014, special number one. This is written and illustrated by Luke Pearson, Jeremy Sorcy, T. Zisk, Janet Rose, and Allison Strejlau. This was a really cute issue. I think the first story was my favorite. Um, They're dealing with snow and Finn and Jake get new sweaters and there's Ice King and it's adorable. (laughs) Yeah, this is a book that is $4.99 and you get several stories in one. Different artists, different look to all of them. Obviously, not all of them are going to be as good as the others, but there are some good stories in this one. I think my favorite was also the first one that you were talking about. Uh, the rest of them were probably my least favorite one was the one with the Lemon King. Oh, um, Lemon Grab? Yeah. It was kind of weird. I don't think it was my least favorite, though. Um, the second story was you have Tree Trunks, and Bimo was there, and Jake was there, and there were some ice cats, and they were in prison, and there was the fire dogs, and I don't know what was going on. Yeah, some of the, like I said, some of the stories won't be as strong as the others, but overall, I think it was a good issue. Mm-hmm. I really like this I think it was worth annual. It. Yeah, more than the, the next one, although this next one was good too. Ah, this one was great! Bravest Warriors 2014 Annual Number 1, written and illustrated by Kate Leth, Coleman Engel, Monica Ray, and Sloan Leong. Uh, this is a cat bug issue, and it was amazing, and I don't know why you don't like it. Get out of my room. 
I didn't say I didn't like it. I said I like the Adventure Time one more. Get out of my room. It's great. We get to see all these different stories with Catbug. I love when Catbug sheds. That was a great story. Yeah. <laughs> he sheds into like this giant cat bug monster thing thing that goes raw and then so they start beating it up and cat bug just runs away he's like <laughs> oh, i'll just go over here and he comes back later he's like why are you beating up my skin <laughs> there's also like the abcs with cat bug and he's just like it gets, it's funny because it starts off pretty simple like e is for eggs and f is for friends but then it gets to like t is for tax evasion <laughs> <laughs> that's great i love cat bug and i just imagined his little cat bug voice the whole time yeah, and then uh, one of the final stories, he just finds peace, and I don't know, he met some friggin'... <laughs> he, he goes around to everyone, he's like, you want to go on an adventure? And nobody wants to go on an adventure for him, so he gets teleported to, like, this rabbit god that knows the whole universe, and he's like, I'll send you on every adventure ever. And he's like, okay! <laughs> and he just goes through, like, his whole life and everyone's life on every adventure ever, and then in the end, he finds peace. Yeah, I like that one too. <laughs> just enlightenment. Yeah, he just all takes in a, nap. a dream. Yeah, it was like um, the fountain. Na 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 na. <laughs> it was great. I thought that issue was worth it. I really liked it. Next up, we have Little Sonia number one. This is written by Jim Zub with art by Joel Carroll. This is my pass of the week. I think it's going to be mine too. The cover is by Art Baltazar, who mm -hmm. we really like. He actually had uh, another book that we're going to cover later on today. The art inside by Joel Carroll. It's not bad. It's no Art Balthazar or Franco, but uh, it was good. It was well colored as well. But the story itself, it was so short, and the book is actually three ninety nine. Wow. I don't feel. I feel like any kids' book should not be more than two ninety nine. Agreed. Unless it's like an annual, or you get tons of pages in it. But I mean, you're reading this book. It's one story, and then it ends, and you still have. Let me count them right now. One, two, three. Four pages of advertisements. Wow. The last four pages are just pages from Dynamite and saying, get this and buy this. The story itself, it's like 75% of the book. And I don't know, I was really disappointed by the time I finished this. I really regretted buying it. Mm -hmm. $3.99 for this one. Yeah, I agree. Also, it the story really wasn't that substantial. It wasn't really cute. Even though it was redheads? and <laughs> Well, you know, okay. Leave the gingers alone. <laughs> We're awesome. But... It it was, I don't know, I love the stories that make me laugh and they're cute and they're adorable, like Catbug. I love the Catbug because I'm like, ah, Catbug, you, you little sucker. Mm -hmm. And this one really wasn't that. It was, oh, this guy did this and we stopped him and, oh no, we're in this situation again. I think kids will, I don't even know if kids will like it, honestly. No. Like, it's simple enough and everything, but I don't know, I didn't feel like it was Red Sonia. It could have just been any character. Exactly. Too short. It's really not worth it pass on it agreed me as well what's next like, danny i think your pick of the week is next what's next danny saga number 18 written by brian k vaughn art by fiona staples my pick forever especially now that little gotham is going away <laughs> it's yes. just saga now yes yes love this book i mean i don't know what my pick of the week is <laughs> no idea this is pretty much the end of this second arc because mm -hmm. the next break is coming after this. They're going to give you the chance to buy the third trade, catch up to the story, and then start releasing the issues again, starting with number 19. Mm -hmm. This was a great story. I think it was a great into an arc tied everything up very well from everything that we've just seen. And it looks like we're going to have some new people chasing them. As they say in the end, um, Hope, I believe is the girl's name. Mm -hmm. Hazel. Hazel. Hazel says, you know, we wouldn't see our original pursuers for a very long time. And there will be a fast forward in the story because we see at the very end, uh, we're not going to spoil it, buy the issue. <laughs> buy it. Definitely buy it. It was great. Um, and I say this every time a saga comes out, and I'll say it again, there hasn't been a bad issue of saga. I felt like every single issue has met what the expectations of the last issue gave us or exceeded those expectations. Mm -hmm. There's never been an issue where I go, eh, that was just a filler or eh, I could have skipped that. Right. Hasn't happened. Um, every time you introduce a new character, like I think we see the reporters for a page or two, not very long. We've only maybe in this whole story seen them for six or seven pages. And I'm like, hey, those guys, what have they been up to? Like not even big characters, but the writing is just so great. It makes you love these guys. 
I can't wait. How many months do I have to wait? Just put me in hibernation. <laughs> Until then. Until then. <laughs> Just make sure I don't lose my job. <laughs> yeah, I felt it was a really good issue too. Uh, not my pick of the week, but it was excellent. Saga, the, anyone can enjoy it, male or female. Uh, I would say probably over the age of 16 or 17 mm-hmm. would be best for this mm-hmm. one. But Yeah. The yeah, others. Some... But it's really good. Did, did you read the notes in the back? No, I didn't. Oh, man, there was this one guy. I was just kind of flipping through, and one of the headlines says, Thanks, Saga, you almost made me lose my job. And I'm like, whoa, what's this? Somebody in Australia was at work, and they're allowed to surf the internet when they're at work, but um, the very strict, it has to be work appropriate. You can't look at anything that's inappropriate. And there was downtime. I think it was a call center or something. So they went on Comixology and pulled up, the last issue of Saga, mm-hmm. where they're half naked on the front, just as her, her boss walked by, <laughs> <laughs> and so she really quick went to she really quick went to click out of it and clicked back to another issue that had something else racy on the front of it, <laughs> and her boss is just like, "I need to see you in my office." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, uh, "Listen, uh, Greg, this is pretty serious. What were you reading? Because." Turn me on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that chick with the wings. Oh, and the horns. <laughs> but no, the person almost lost it. They got it like a verbal warning. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> well done, Saga. <laughs> awesome. You're probably going to see a lot of Saga cosplayers at MegaCon. Oh, yeah. We saw we last, last year, year, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They we're going to see really way more. To... Yeah. I would love to cosplay as Saga, but I don't have the right color skin. <laughs> yeah. I'm redhead. We're kind of transparent. Happens. <laughs> what, what did Conan say? He's translucent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's past white. <laughs> that is the color of my skin. I think you're going to see a lot of... I know we're going on to cosplaying for a bit, but I think we're going to see a lot of Legend of Korra. The Legend of Korra, definitely. A ton of Legend of Korra cosplays. And I think we're going to see more Tomb Raider as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the big one, though, will probably be... Harley Quinn. <laughs> we always see like seven of them. Oh, yeah. They're always like fat Harley Quinns or... Okay. I'm going to say leave them alone again. No, <laughs> but see, I'm I'm the really, really bad person where I'm like, if you're not going to look right in the costume, don't make it. Don't don't wear it. I don't know. That's just me. You are Walt Flanagan <laughs> is who you are. <laughs> but like, okay, so I have this great costume that I want to make, not for this Megacon, but for next Megacon. And I know I need to be in shape. I'm not going to put on that costume if I'm not in shape enough to wear that costume. So you think if you don't look like the character, you shouldn't cosplay as the character? Yes. Got you now. Because what if they want to be black Captain America? What if they want to be white Blade? Can they not do it because do they, they don't have look muscles? like the character? Do they have Captain America muscles? Maybe, or are, maybe... they just, are they just putting in padding so that they like have these skinny little hands and then these huge muscles? Let's say they have muscles, but they're just the wrong... the the. the that's different fine. skin color do what you want oh that's fine yes. <laughs> no you that's just fine. said that I'm if talking, they don't look like I'm the talking co- about character weight and i'm talking about physical okay if you're starfire and you have like a muffin top no i think it's fine well you let them think have what you fun wanna, you they're think what you want to think representing the characters i'm just i'm just telling you they're butchering the characters twitter question of the week okay. bro cats back me up no back me up <laughs> who's the one who cosplays here I cosplayed once. Yeah, as Charlie Chaplin. So the best character ever in film. <laughs> <laughs> so the Twitter question of the week. Can you cosplay as something? No, no. The question is not can you. Yes, I can cosplay as whatever I want. Should, Should I cosplay? Should someone cosplay if they do not look like the character? At Reasons I'm Broke over Twitter. Or if you like us on Facebook, just let us know on Facebook. I'll post up the question later today. That does bring me to another question, though. So I'm trying to make this cosplay costume. If any of you have tips, send them my way. (laughs) All right, we can move on to the next comic book. Mm -hmm. Your pick of the week? My pick of the week. It was a very good comic, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 30, written by Tom Waltz and Kevin Eastman, with art by Ross Campbell. I loved everything from this comic. I love the art. I love the writing. I like the pacing. I like what they're doing with the characters as well, especially Splinter and Alopex. Like, there's something interesting there going on. Raphael and Alopex, every single character has their moment in this book where they're struggling with that change that Leonardo went through. And then you finally focus on Leonardo and his inner troubles. It's just a perfect issue. Great comic. One of my favorite TMNTs to date. It was. It was very good. Um, the thing that draws me in most is the cover. 
everyone knows I like Mikey. He's my favorite character and it's just, it's a beautiful cover and, and this whole comic kind of revolves around him too because it's him writing a letter to his pizza delivery guy friend. Right. And informing him of everything that's going on and I think that's a great way that they sped up time and still kept you involved in everything and it didn't feel like they were like, here's a recap. Right. Yeah, if you want to see the cover, head over to our YouTube channel because I made it the default picture for our list of episodes. You'll see Michelangelo sitting on a tree stump writing a letter. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, great bit of news after this arc is finished and after this artist, who I really like, uh, Matteo Santoloco is coming back. Awesome. So it's like, oh, damn, we're losing this good artist after we just lost another one, but the old one's coming back. <laughs> So I like really like this artist, win -win. though. I think for what they moved into, his art was great for that because it's very soft and very, um, it looks very young. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, they've all been kind of stripped of all those emotions and they, they are very young and vulnerable at this point. So I think that that was great for the feeling. Of the entire comic book, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, and it symbolized what you've pointed out several times, that Michelangelo is probably the one that's keeping the turtles together. I love Mikey. Similar, and everything leads back to Batman, that's the rule. Similar to The Flash in Justice League, <laughs> Unlimited in Justice League. <laughs> Agreed. So my pick of the week, TMNT number 30. Moving on to some Marvel books. Cataclysm, Ultimate's Last Stand, number 4 of 5. So it's almost over. Turns out not the end of the Ultimate Universe if you check out the previews catalog. Uh, this issue is written by Brian Michael Bendis, art by Mark Bagley, who of course has worked on Ultimate Spider-Man for years. This was a great issue as well. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> the cover, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have to talk about the cover. We do have to talk about the cover. So it's Spider-Man, Ultimate Spider-Man, holding Captain America <laughs> with his hand on his hand with his hand on his head, like, oh no! And Captain America's falling down, like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> And what really happened in this comic, Danny? Well, when I first saw the cover, I was like, oh, Captain America died again? <laughs> you read the comic, he's fine. <laughs> you got it. You can't judge a book by its cover, Danny. It's just like a grab your attention type. Maybe he does die in the next issue, but you don't see it here. But one of my coworkers, he, really funny, we were talking about this cover. He's like, what if in one of the DC books, Batman, like, throws a battering into a portal and that's all. That's all you see of it. Like the story moves on, and then you're reading Cataclysm, and Captain America's talking to Spidey in the middle of a battle or whatever. And then from I don't know where this battering comes, <laughs> probably from that same portal, hits him in the head, knocks him out, and Spider-Man's like, "Oh no!" And that's what this cover is. He just got knocked out by Batman. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> amazing. So Cap's fine. He's just knocked out by Batman. It's it's just an attention grabber. Good job, Batman. <laughs> Take him to Arkham. <laughs> <laughs> but back on to what this book really is. It was really good. We get to see they go after the X-Men and have them join and doing stuff and somebody's going to die. I thought that was really well written. When uh, Kitty Pride has to be used mm -hmm. against Galactus and because she might die. Yeah. I haven't seen her. I mean, I don't read the X-Men, but I haven't seen anything of her character. And we're at this point right now where I've seen her for two pages now. And I'm like, oh, shit. I don't want her to die. That's right. some good writing. Yeah, they finally came up with a plan to get rid of Galactus, who, if you know, he's the merged product of Ultimate Galactus and the 616 Universe Galactus. And he hungers, so he's sucking everything up and just getting ready to destroy the universe. But they came up with a plan. It involves Kitty Pride, And we're going to see if that plan succeeds in the next and final issue of this series. But more importantly, the Ultimate Universe is continuing. In this month's previews, we saw that the new Ultimates is made up of that team that we've been talking about yeah. from the Ultimate Spider-Man. So excited. You have Cloak and Dagger and Spider-Man and Spider-Woman. Was mm -hmm. she in there? And yeah. the lady with the bombs. I don't know her name, but she blows stuff up. Mm -hmm. Exciting. I love Cloak and Dagger. And then Miles Morales is getting his own book. It's called Miles Morales Ultimate Spider-Man. So that's continuing. We'll see what really happens Really happy about dad. that. Yeah, I know. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> but since we like this book so much, why don't you guys take a read and see what you think? First person to redeem this code brought to you by Megacon. You just go to marvel.com slash redeem. The code is T-M-A-Y-E-G-W-G-4-Q-5-9. Let us know what you think over Twitter at Reasons I'm Broke. If you don't like it, don't let us know. I'm kidding. No, no, no. Let us know what you think. I think it's great. 
Next Marvel book is Superior Spider-Man number 26, written by Dan Slott, art by Umberto Ramos and Ryan Stegman. This was great too, but we are about to get Peter Parker back. Without a doubt. You see exactly how Peter Parker comes back. We saw it last time too, but now we, we know that he is ready to take over his body and, I guess, save New York. Mm-hmm. Um, you get to see more of the goblins running around and the goblin war, and now Green Goblin has this huge-ass team. And the Avengers are getting smart about Doc Ock and how it's really not Peter Parker under there. What's going to happen is Peter Parker's going to take over and push Doc Ock out, and the Avengers are still going to be like, no, you're still Doc Ock. We don't trust Damn you. Damn it, now he's in jail for 20 issues. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun with the run, Superior Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, we really like Doc Ock. We kind of wish they had done more with the relationship that he had, yeah. that he was building. And even with the school, with the professor, that was a lot of fun just seeing him fuck with that professor. And, you know, I guess it is time for Parker to return. It's like, how many more stories could they have really done with Doc Ock? Uh, I don't think we're not going to pick up Amazing Spider-Man. We started picking up Superior Spider-Man because of this concept. And it sounded interesting, and it was. And it was a great run. But with Peter Parker back, we're just, you know, we'll drop yeah. the the yeah. issue, the book. And it's funny, we did the opposite of what everyone else did. Everyone <laughs> drops Superior's Spider-Man because of Doc Ock. We're like, you know what? Let's, Let's pick, pick up Doc up. Ock, yeah. I will say I'm a little disappointed. I felt that the first few issues of this run were much stronger than where it's ended. And I don't know if, if the writer, you know, is just upset because, oh, all these people hated it or what went on there. But in the beginning, I was like, oh, man, this is amazing. You have all this development and da-da-da-da. And then it feels like the character kind of plateaued. And that was a little disappointing for me. Either way, it was a great book, though. Mm-hmm. Next, we have Adventures of Superman number 9, a.k.a. Superman Loves Batman. Because every book about Superman is a Superman Loves Batman book. <laughs> but officially, the Batman Superman book is Superman well, okay. That's like a super... Superman loves Batman. <laughs> <laughs> this one is written by Christos Gage with art by Eduardo Francisco. This, oh man, this was a great issue too. Really impressed with these last two adventures yeah, of Superman. Yeah, I really like this one. This one is kind of a what if Bizarro became rational. If they could fix, yeah, exactly. They fixed Bizarro in this and what made this issue good, it's not necessarily the solution they came up with or if you know bizarro ended up reverting or whatever it's exploring how bizarro feels to know now that the whole time he's actually been doing things that weren't good right and hurting people potentially and the whole difference is that he feels he knows what it it's like to be the alien like superman except he's feeling it at an older age whereas superman grew up with it and adapted it's a really good issue it focuses on bizarro like i've never seen before Mm -hmm. and and you really feel bad for Bizarro, especially when you see at the end that his intentions were good. So. Right. Well, and you talked about kind of the cure for him. I really liked how they did that, though, because it was, you know, he scans him under an MRI and he goes, he's he has kind of the same signs of Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. where everything's a big mess. And the only way that he can kind of put stuff into order is by doing the opposite of whatever Superman does. That's right. how he brings order into his life. I thought that was great. And then a lot of, you get to see a lot of his character and it's very complex. I kind of like him more than Superman now. I'm going to throw that <laughs> out there. Not me. I'm not going that far. <laughs> <laughs> but this does have your gay Superman moment of the week. And yeah, with that, we need the Superman Loves Batman theme song. This moment comes when Superman and Bizarro go to save a boat, and the part that's touching in this scene is you have everyone's congratulating Superman and nobody's really congratulating Bizarro, and that makes Bizarro sad and start to understand. But there's this woman who goes to congratulate Superman. Let's hear what happens. (laughs) And if you follow us on Twitter, you saw this already, but she runs up to Superman, kisses him in the face, and says, Superman, marry me. And you see Superman's face, and he's not even touching her. His hands are out like, I don't want to touch you. You're not Batman. (laughs) Totally true. It's not because she had on a wedding ring. 
Yeah, it's not like what it says in the comic book. It's actually, he's like, ugh, women. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not Batman. <laughs> Hope he's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, wedding ring or not, if I saw Batman, I'd probably propose to him, too. <laughs> and he'd say no and throw a battery and knock you out <laughs> like Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> throw it through a portal and it comes through another portal. <laughs> so that was the Superman Loves Batman moment of the week. Pretty good moment. Pretty good book. Adventures of Superman number nine. This next one made me laugh a lot, too. Batman and Robin Annual number two. It's written by Peter J. Tomasi with art by Doug Mankey. Love Doug Mankey. He did the work for Green Lantern. He can. He drew Sinestro. Remember, we saw the Parallax Sinestro? Yeah. Such a great page. One of my favorite pages in comics. One of, one of my favorite books, actually, from the New 52, also drawn by Doug Mankey. So he does some work here, along with Pat Gleason, actually. There are a couple pages here done by Pat, and it's kind of mixed into the comic book. This is the early story of Dick Grayson with Batman, the origin of their team-up. Mm-hmm. Yep, how Dick Grayson became Robin. So it is still a Batman and Robin, even though it's not Damien. Uh, we still see them dealing with Damien's death, which I thought was great. Nightwing is whiny. Robin, you mean. <laughs> well, Robin, yeah. Whiny. Whiny, whiny, whiny. Like, in every panel, I think I kept turning to you and making his face and be like, Ew, <laughs> this thing. <laughs> He makes the funniest, like, even when he's smiling, he looks like he's whining. Yeah, about something. Oh, yeah. you won't let me come on patrol with you? No, because you're a 16-year-old brat. He was super whiny in this, which was very in character, so good job, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Peter J. Tomasi. But he, even when, in, during his origin, he disobeys Batman and acts up and everything to the point where Batman says, you're fired. And, and Alfred gives Batman shit about it. I'm like, why is Alfred always on Dick Grayson's side? I don't get this. Like, every time he's always on Dick Grayson's when side. When else was he on his side? In the earlier Batman books, whenever Batman would be, like, hard on Robin, he'd be like, oh. sir. It's like, Alfred, why are you? Why do you care about this Robin so much? Like, And here you have the same thing when he's like, Bruce, overreact? Never. Like, he says something like that. I'm like, Alfred, why are you making... Stop making Batman feel bad. Batman doesn't feel bad. Are you kidding? He does when it's Alfred. Yeah, well. He takes it to heart when it's Alfred. Because Alfred is... He's he's better than Flash and the Justice League or Michelangelo in TMNT. He keeps Batman together. This was a very touching issue, though. I think we had to deal with a lot of filler of... This is Nightwing dealing with... Or I guess he was Robin. This is Dick Grayson dealing with this specific villain. And how he told Damien about it. And then, oh, look, he even looks whiny in that page. He's flipping through. Sorry, guys. He's like, ew, I'm flipping. <laughs> like, stop being so whiny. Uh, but in the end, we do get a very touching Damien moment, proving that Damien's better than Dick Grayson, obviously. Yeah, it all involves the character of Tusk. And yeah, you're right. At the very end, Damien proves that he's more effective, younger, faster than Dick ever was as Robin, the mm -hmm. superior Robin. And that's why Dick Grayson will always be known as Robin, because Robin equals whininess. Dick Grayson is Robin, Damian Wayne is Damian Wayne, <laughs> Tim Drake is Red Robin, and Jason Todd is the Red Hood. <laughs> he was pretty whiny too, which, you know, okay, but, but not like Dick Grayson level of whiny. How could you let him do this to me? Oh, <laughs> on the Batman of the Red Hood? Yeah. Took you away from me. <laughs> Batman's just looking at him like, what? <laughs> we, we weren't in a relationship. <laughs> I don't know what you thought this was about. <laughs> Everyone falls for me. Well, it's true. Tired of it. He's not. Except when it comes to Talia. No. I don't mind that. No. He, <laughs> Batman would never say any of those things. He needs to have people fall for them so he has them under his control. <laughs> Superman. Batman is greater than Kryptonite when it comes to Superman. That's true. Amazing. Batman so just unbuttons the first two buttons. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm so weak, <laughs> and I'm tired, so I'm going to sit down. <laughs> There's not even kryptonite in the room. <laughs> oh, Superman, such an interesting character. <laughs> but this Batman and Robin annual number two, we really liked it. If mm -hmm. you've been enjoying the Batman and Robin series, don't skip out on this one, especially if you like Damian Wayne. The next Batman issue is Batman the Dark Knight number 27. It's written by Greg Hurwitz with art by Alberto Ponticelli. I thought this was going to be your pick of the week. <laughs> Why is that? Because <laughs> you like Batman the Dark Knight all the time. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> you're Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, another silent issue. Number 26 was silent as well. You get no dialogue. It's all pictures. And it's really is Batman, a fun read. 
Batman being kick-ass and seeing a different side of Batman that you don't normally see. Because, yeah, Batman's always beating up the bad guys because they're doing shitty things and stealing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is Batman beating up the bad guys because they were doing something morally wrong to other people who don't deserve that. Right. It continues the story of the immigrants that came to the U.S. from... They don't really specify. It's somewhere in South America, Latin America, because you do see some of the signs that are in Spanish. But they come to the U.S. They come to Gotham of all places and uh, they work here and it's just it's the classic immigrant story of their struggles and not everything goes well for them especially here in Gotham and Batman saves them because even if they're just immigrating to Gotham City they're still to him they're still his Gothamites they're still his people and he's going to be there for anyone that needs that protection which in this case it's the immigrants that were being taken advantage of the bad guys fucking morons they capture Batman Put him in a cage and nobody watches him. <laughs> he escapes within seconds. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's fucking Batman. <laughs> and at the very end of it, it turns out that the Grammy uh, winner, Penguin, <laughs> was behind it all. Yep. It was a great issue. Um, another thing that I really liked about it, too, was you get to see him use his connections as Bruce Wayne to help make a better life for these people also. Yeah. He not only saves them as Batman, but also as Bruce. Ah, great. Love you, Batman. Mmm. <laughs> 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 We're going to move on to another Batman comic, Damien, Son of Batman, number four of four. Writing and art by Andy Kubert. Honestly, this one uh, disappointed me. Me as well. I felt uh, like the previous issues were, they were, you know, making something pretty interesting. Uh, and number four had, it was kind of like the make or break moment for this series. And I felt like it kind of dropped it at the end. Yep, I agree. Uh, the end got very confusing for me. It's like, now it's over and we're here. Uh, uh What? Yeah, like basically the only thing you take away from number four is that other villains can tell that Damien is just trying to, at the end of the day, he's just trying to impress Bruce and show his dad that he can be Batman, that he isn't um, just a murderer as he was raised by the Al Ghouls. He doesn't really prove it in the end because, I mean, I guess we can spoil the issue. It's not It's not going to be something that's going to be huge or anything. It's not going to be what's based on the movie either. But he ends up uh, murdering the new Joker that takes over Gotham. Sort he would he, the guy would have died. Like he splits him open. <laughs> yeah, but somebody else ultimately murdered him. Finishes him off, I guess. I don't know. It, it just kind of goes to show that this Damien is is not Bruce Wayne. He's not really Batman because Batman always finds a way to stop the criminals, puts them in Arkham, even though that's a revolving door, and stops them again. Mm -hmm. That's what Batman does, and that's the harder choice, and that's what makes him Batman is that he will you know continue to do that, and it's an endless struggle. Damien he eventually cracks, and you see it in the in the previous. I think it was Batman or Detective Comics number six 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 where he murders villains and he makes Gotham into his booby trap place. And, you know, he's he's not going to be Batman. Yeah. Agreed. It, it was very disappointed. I think it started out really great. And I don't know why this always happens. <laughs> Things start out great, except for Saga. And then it's like, and then this. I don't know. I think it could have used another two issues. If that. I don't know. And it would have been a little bit better. If Maybe. they could have stretched out this ending a little more. They never find out who killed Dick, Dick Grayson. Grayson. I wanted to know. Oh, well, uh, not our pass of the week, but I would say pass on yeah, it. Yeah, probably. Our final issue for this week is Green Team Teen Trillionaires number 8, which is also the final issue of this series. Mm -hmm. It's written by Art Baltazar and Franco with art by Ig Guada. Another disappointing issue. Really? You've been liking these up until, like, the last two, I think, when yeah, they started they, ending them. They, they still, they just gave up. And now everyone has powers, and now everyone's in a relationship, and now these things are happening. And now his dad's here, and his dad still hates him. And I did we ever figure out why his dad hates him? Something with technology. Okay. And, uh, and, you like this way more than and I do. And now his dad has more superpowers, and now we killed him, but we're all still alive. And now we're going to buy the Teen Titans. Randomly. <laughs> that Okay, to be fair, them buying the Teen Titans was their way, the writer's way of being like, see, these characters can still exist somewhere else, even though the series is ending. You don't want to see that you like the characters. I did, but let's buy the Teen Titans. I think they'll. I think they're gonna make a new Teen Titans team after this Teen Titans series is over, and they'll probably mix in some of the members from the Green Team that were more interesting, like the Sasquatch. He was kind of cool. Really, I liked the Mo Kid. Was he the guy that could teleport? Yes. Yeah, he was pretty cool too. But he was also like, "When can you do this? I don't know. I can just do it. <laughs> I now. can do it now. I figured this out." By <laughs> they should have. They should have just said the comics ending. So I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. 
<laughs> we are expecting the other 10 issues. <laughs> Uh, someone on Twitter said that they were disappointed that all the fun issues seem to always get canceled by DC. Yeah. But People it, don't buy them, it though. It comes it's, down to sales. Yeah, yeah exactly. Unfortunately. So that's but the it thing. But it was great in the beginning when they come out with the trade. Yeah, pick up the trade. Read through it. I mean, DC tries to do new original stuff because we ask for it, and then we don't pick it up. So pick it up. Support it. It's probably going to be like 10 bucks. We'll probably get another Batman book now. Well, yeah, because that sells. <laughs> <laughs> That's how this works. <laughs> Besides, it's Batman. You can. Well, yeah. We I'd be okay always... if all fifty-two issues were just Batman series. I'd be like, all right then. <laughs> we would have no money ever. <laughs> fifty-two times what? Four dollars a week. But we still wouldn't pick three? up Batman Eternal because that's ridiculous. <laughs> Wait, I want to see how much money this is. All right, she's gonna figure it out. What does Batman cost? Fifty-two issues. How much is an issue? Uh, two ninety nine to three ninety nine, depending. So how much did I put? Three fifty. Yeah. We would be spending one hundred and eighty two dollars before tax a month, a week. Wow. A month. That's crazy. One hundred and eighty two dollars. <laughs> More reasons to be broke. <laughs> That's just our Batman ones. That's not including Marvel or Saga. <laughs> just Batman. Just Batman. So that will uh, wrap it up for comics this week mm -hmm. and for the rest of the podcast. A lot of news today Ugh. and a lot of comic books. <laughs> yeah, just to summarize our comic books, my pick of the week was Saga, number 18. And mine was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number 30. And both of our passes of the week was Little Sonia, number 1. The Reasons I'm Broke, episode number 73, was brought to you by Megacon 2014. Get your tickets at megaconvention.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Reasons I'm Broke. You can also check us out on iTunes. Just search The Reasons I'm Broke. Make sure you leave us a comment or a rating. It helps other people find us. If you have an iDevice or any kind of Android device, you can go ahead and download the Stitcher app. Just search The Reasons I'm Broke. Updates it so that the newest episodes are right there in your pocket. We also upload to YouTube. We have the regular podcast up there as well as some unboxings of statues that we get, which also make us broke. <laughs> And finally, Facebook. Head on over to Facebook and search The Reasons I'm Broke. Like us on Facebook for more pictures and news. And don't forget to respond to our Twitter question of the week. Should people cosplay if they don't look like the characters? Not can, should. We'll share the responses on next week's episode. Thank you all very much for listening. I'm Kelly. And I'm Daniel. And we'll see you next week.